Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to tonight's talk with Ellis Brigham and Glenmore Lodge, which is all about navigation uh, next steps. Uh, before we begin, I just want to apologise to any of you who tuned in last week and uh, for the confusion that we had over some of the times and some of the technical issues. Hopefully tonight, fingers crossed, uh, will go a lot more smoothly. And um, thank you to all those who did get in touch after the talk to, um, to say that how much they enjoyed the session. It's always appreciated. Tonight's talk is the follow-up to last week's session, which was new to maps, which you can actually watch still on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by the guys at Glenmore Lodge. And thank you guys for giving up your time this evening. Ellis Brigham and Glenmore Lodge have been working together for the last six years, equipping people for the outdoors. So it's, um, it's great to be able to put on this talk this evening. For anyone who doesn't know, Glenmore Lodge is Scotland's national training centre and um, they offer hundreds of outdoor courses. So please do check them out if you've um, not, not come across them before. Tonight, we're joined by Head of Mountaineering at Glenmore Lodge, John Jones. Um, this is a live and interactive talk. And um, so we'll be taking your questions throughout the evening. If you're watching on Facebook, then please do add in your comments below the video and we will we'll be monitoring those. If you're watching on Zoom, then please use the Q&A to ask any questions. And John has two assistants behind the scenes, Giles and Bill, who will be um, looking after the questions. And um, we'll also be taking questions at the end as well. So um, please please do send in your questions. So um, I'll, I'll hand over to John then, really. Hello, John, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for that intro. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, giving up your time to come along this evening and get a, a bit of input on some uh, mountain navigation. Uh, I'll emphasize what Mark was saying. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here doing the easy bit, really, which is just sort of chatting through, delivering, you know, what I do. So it's quite easy for me to chat through this. Um, so what would be great is if you can challenge Giles and Bill with any questions that you may have that uh, you want to build, you know, that you, you, you ask that you want me to, to build on, you know, maybe at the end of the talk or if you want the guys to, to come in with something with a different angle, you know, don't hesitate to ask a question. And no question is a silly question. And don't worry if it's a question about last week's uh, talk, that's not a problem. Or if there's any questions about after this talk, you know, what, what, what you do beyond this. Uh, it's, it's not it's not a problem uh this week's talk is probably a little bit longer than last week's just purely because there's a little bit more going on uh when it comes to navigation and you know the um the next steps then um we tend to use technology a little bit more and i'll chat about that there's more discussion around um taking a bearing the use of a compass i'm going to talk in a bit more detail about that um, I'm going to chat a little bit about, you know, poor weather navigation uh, and, and if we get lost, you know, if it goes wrong and, and, and that can happen for, for different reasons for people. So, um, um, you know, so we'll, we'll deal with that at the end because, you know, we, let's, let's, let's deal with all the positives first um, and then we can, uh, we can then look to see what's gone wrong. Bill, you popped your hand up. Is there something there that you want to say before I carry on? No, he's taking his hand away. Sorry, John, no. Oh, no, he's coming. He, he's... <laughs> Are you, you bombing my talk, Bill? <laughs> um, great. So uh, what I've left in, just uh, so you can see my pointer here, just a reminder of last week is we've got our five deals, and we're going to build on that. And just to remind you, direction, just to make sure we're, all, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're planning our route, we're heading the right way, we're designing it, yeah? So we're, we're, we're thinking about how we've, We've planned our day, our route. We've worked out our distances, how long it's going to take. And then also then the description, we're going to try and visualize what, what, what our day or, or what our leg might be about. And, and, and pretty much this talk is, is built around this kind of um, these five Ds. Uh, just to remind you all, you know, uh, I can't see any of you. You can all see me. Uh, please use it. Uh, we've got here the chat box, but I see it's the Q&A box. Please use the Q&A box and Giles and Bill will, will do the rest. And, and you already know that those guys are there in, in the background. Um, there's my reminder clip again. So here we go. Um, 
you might remember last week, Bill mentioned about, you know, before we go on any any route, we're, we're planning um, our, our day or our half day or hours walk. Um, because to prevent some of these things that we've mentioned about, you know, uh, navigating in poor weather or, or if we get lost, if we have really good planning, or if we, sorry, not really good planning, if we spend time with our planning, then hopefully that will prevent any, any kind of mishap uh, occurring on our journey, whether that is just an hour's walk with, you know, the kids out the car and the buggy and all that kind of thing, or whether it's a, a day out with, with friends or with people maybe you, you've only met recently, so you're still sort of getting to know each other as a new group of friends. When it comes to the planning, key things you consider is it's um, the symbol here is for like the weather and the conditions. So, you know, uh, using the appropriate mountain weather forecast, weather apps, etc. I'm, I'm going to look at them in a moment um, so that you're aware what's going to what, what, what's what's uh, what's going on out there. So also that you're properly equipped, you know, you've got the right equipment for you that, you know, you've got um, waterproofs uh, or hat and gloves if it's low temperatures, um, etc. Um, the second one here, the sort of the, the, the symbol uh, for, for, uh, for people is, you know, make sure with your planning, you know, you know who you're going out with. Um, you are, uh, everybody's like minded. You've got the same aspirations is really important for, for the day out. Um, you know, you don't want to spring on someone that actually it's, you know, uh, it's a 10 hour day and you're going to be going 25 kilometers and, and doing 2000 meters in height going through the day. That could be a big shocker for someone. It would be for me. Um, you know that everybody's buying in to the same the same deal. So whether that is a family walk around the lock and and it's a, appropriate for Granny right down to to the the wee ones on their scooter bikes, um, or whether you know it's a group of friends. You know you you plan the day online. This is the first time you're getting out, but you you've you've all you're you're aspiring to the same kind of day. Uh, and the final one is this: the, the the image here is the mountain. Is you know the train that you tend to visit. Make sure that in your planning, you know. You're, you've researched the terrain, you're aware of what you're letting yourselves in for, you know, whether it's a, a path walk or whether you're going off the path or whether it's rugged terrain, um, you know, what altitude it's at, you know, again, and that will bring you back then to the weather conditions, etc. So these, these three symbols are just a really good uh, template to stick to when it comes to any of your, when, when, uh, any of your planning in your day out. Uh, tools with that, then, you know, like last week, you know, decide on the kind of map, you know, uh, mapping beforehand. There could be some uh, guidebooks about the area um, online, loads of information about different walks online. Uh, we tend to use a lot, a lot of them, uh, I use a lot of them with my own family. I went, uh, use a lot, a lot online sort of walks and it gives you, you know, you can get images, people's description, etc. They might even have shown it on their, G they might have even mapped it on a GPS so you can see the route on the map, etc. Um, obviously, you know, measuring distance with your with your compasses if you if you want to work out in a bit more detail the size of your journey. And the other thing is technology. Let's not ignore that. It's uh, technology is out there, and it's completely out there for us to use. And be silly for us to shy away from it. But the key thing is, is what's really important is making sure that we're not completely relying just on technology. So I'm I'm definitely using technology. Um, as a tool in my planning and when I'm on, on my journey, but I'm not completely relying on it, okay? And I'll, and I'll chat in a bit more detail as, as we go along with that. Uh, some things I've, I've highlighted here on this slide is uh, what I call my, my planning tools. And this is all from on my phone because, uh, or my iPad, you know, when I'm planning at home. Um, fat map here uh, is excellent for giving you uh, like um, a visual of, of what the ground is like and you can, uh, click on different keys to tell you maybe what an angle of slope is or highlight footpaths, um, et cetera. Um, View Ranger is a very good um, app. You can have different scales in here, one to 25, one to 50, uh, Harveys, et cetera, to um, help, you know, you could even plot the track if you wanted to. Um, or if you haven't got mapping for that air, for the area you're going to, you can always use your phone um, before, you know, you've, you've had a chance to, to grab, grab, grab the, an actual paper map to take on, on the hill with, with you. Um, with that, I will use my uh, weather apps so I can look at the weather forecast. So here you know, we've got the Glenmore forecast because that's where we're starting from for our journey. Um, and also, you know, depending on where I'm walking, uh, if I'm down south, I'm going to look on the BMC website for here over north of the border. Then it's mountaineering in Scotland because we do need to consider our access. 
And something we've got to consider in Scotland is, you know, certain times of year, there's always some kind of hunting going on, you know, uh, and there'll be people either, you know, fishing. So we've got to be careful, you know, when we're, when we're doing, when we're on river walks, we've got to be care very careful when it comes to the grouse season uh, up here, uh, but also when it's deer stalking, that's something we've got to have a great awareness of. So, you know, these are four pretty, pretty key apps that I've got, got, on, my, uh, got on my phone. Um, if I shuffle along. So yeah, you know, which scale am I going to work with? Uh, you know, living uh, from being from North Wales originally, I know that I two one to twenty five two OS one to twenty five thousand maps would cover cover the whole of Snowdonia, and what on one single one to fifty that, that does it does the business. Um, living in Scotland though, it's completely different, and the scale is so massive that uh, a lot of the time I'm actually working on a one to fifty because um, uh, OS. Uh, won't have produced enough one to twenty fives, or you know, that are appropriate for the areas I want to go walking to, or it's, I'm just working on such a massive scale that it's actually the appropriate map to work with. Um, but also, there's Harveys, and something to, for, for you to know about OS. OS are fantastic maps, um, great scale, uh, very common. You know, something we would be familiar with, um, but they're not. The, the one to 50 isn't really designed for walkers. We're, we're a little bit further down their kind of priority list. And it's more for kind of emergency services, uh, military, et cetera. So they don't get updated quite as regularly as maybe the Explorer map, the one to 25, um, uh, will get updated a little bit more. But what is a very reliable walker or climbers map is the Harveys, because it is, Harveys are there for us as sort of outdoor um, enthusiasts. and. So they will update that a lot more regularly and they'll do um, a lot of surveys on the ground. Also talk to the local community to ask about uh, local paths or dwellings and um, ruins and things like that. So, and local history, because I have a lot of information on the back. So um, what you tend to find is uh, there's a lot of us who've got very comfortable with, with using um, a Harvey's map because of that extra detail. Um, the other beauty of the Harvey's is um, I, I quite personally, I quite like the shading. It really helps the features to stand out for me. Um, uh, you know, the, the different colors can, can really help. Um, whereas on the OS, this is a one to 25. For me, it's quite busy and I tend to lose some of the detail. And, and then this is your standard kind of uh, OS one of 50 where, you know, yeah, there's, it, it's pretty basic on the detail. There's enough there, but, um, but yeah, it's pretty basic. So yeah, there's some just sort of personal preferences really, I suppose, around kind of, kind of map scales. Um, so yeah, so that's all to do with my planning. And like I say, I'm using my phone without or my iPad in the evening beforehand. I'm choosing the type of map I'm gonna use. I've researched maybe on websites, information, or I've gone to uh, certain books to, to, to find out uh, more information about my walk. Um, this talk basically is uh, this, sorry, this sort of next set of slides is, is pretty much about this, doing this walk in a, what's that, an anti-clockwise uh, direction. And if I hover my little pointer over, so this is Glenmore Lodge, uh, where myself, Giles and Burl are very lucky to work at. Uh, this is a fantastic local walk that, um, that a lot of folk will do locally, a lot of families, um, et cetera. Uh, and this is a really lovely Corbett. Um, uh, Hill of the Shepherd, uh, it's a 360 view of the whole area. Um, so, you know, this is an old drover's route. So in sort of uh, go back to sort of clan times, they would move their cattle through here. Uh, hence, this is the Hill of the Shepherd. So they could sort of more, more want to see where the cattle were going, but also to see if there was anybody trying to steal the cattle. That was probably the key reason. Um, but yeah, my, my walk basically is going to take me out of Glen, Glenmore Lodge uh, along this lovely weed um, valley here where uh, I'm going to chat about collecting features, drive own boffy, which is a catching feature, which I'll describe. Then up this mountain path, which is steep in places, uh, to the summit. And then for this walk, and this is where it's really important when it comes to my planning of, of have I got the skills um, the, and the ability to undertake this walk? Because in, in uh, bad weather and low cloud, then for me to come down this part of the hill, then I need to be able to take a bearing to get safely uh, to come off the, the, the right part of the, the hill. Um, if, if I'm, you know, if, if the conditions are, are pretty bad or I'm not confident about taking a bearing off here, I can just stay on the path and come and traverse the mountain and drop down 
actually down this way here and come off the hill there. So I have got a backup plan if, if I don't want to wander down here. That could almost be my, my escape plan. Um, but to do this walk, obviously, we need to have a, a, a level of fitness, a level of confidence, uh, a level of knowledge of, of navigation, um, an idea of time. But more importantly, the key thing is to be able to take a bearing off the, off, off the hill here. And, and I'm going to look at that, I almost look at taking a bearing in isolation in, in, in a moment. Um, uh, this is a reminder from, from last week. I know Bill spent quite a bit of time on this. I'm just going to briefly touch on it, but setting the map, super important. Um, I'm not worrying about this when I'm doing my planning at home, you know, my iPad or paper maps. This is, this is when I'm on the hill. This is, this is probably the most crucial bit when you're trying to leave the car park in the right direction. Yeah, or, you know, or you've got off the bus and you're at the bus stop and to save you walking down the road for half a mile, realize you're walking the wrong way and having to turn back. But setting the map is the key thing that I'm doing from as soon as I start my journey. So, I'm, so before I leave the car park, but whenever I'm pausing at any point, setting the map is king. And, um, and what I'm doing, I'm, I'm either using the, the, sorry, on the two maps here, actually, you can see how a Harvey's uh, sounds pretty clearly compared to the, to the OS here. But, you know, I'm definitely highlighting my personal preference here. Um, and we, remember, we can set the map in two ways. We can use user features around us. Uh, and line anything up, or I can use my if, or if I'm in you know in the forest, or I'm in uh, or if I'm on the hill, I'm in I'm in Clag and I can't see features. Then, if I remind you from last week, that's when I use my compass, because the top of the map is always north, and the the writing goes from north to south down the map. And remember, the red needle on my compass always points north, so that's why I used to help help myself set the map. At this point, I think it's really important to remind. I'm going to bring all them up because I hate it when they. There we go. Um, it, it's important just to get a wee bit of familiarity with the compass because we're going to look at that next in isolation. But a couple of key things here, the base plate, the big flat bit at the bottom, uh, compass needle is that red floaty arrow that riddles around. Um, the compass housing is the twiddly, twiddly round bit. Um, the orienteering arrows are those fixed red and black lines within the compass housing. Um, this bit's really important, the compass, the, the uh, direction of travel arrow. And then all of these bits down the side here are different ways of measuring. Um, and uh, this is a silver type four compass, which if anybody comes on a course, we recommend, we, we pretty much recommend the silver type four. It's, it's pretty much one, you know, a, a very good compass that you can use out there. It's got all the, all the attributes that you need for, for navigation. Um, the Roma, it's got a 125, a 150, and one, a lot of them can do 40 now. Uh, personally, I like to use the mills down the side. Yeah, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll chat about that. Uh, in a moment. Um, so, you know, taking the bearing, actually, this is a quick shot from the summit of that hill, Mila Buko, looking out to the Cairngorms, absolutely stunning uh, location. And when it comes to taking a bearing, um, then it's just having that, um, first of all, that, that uh, it's good to practice it when you don't need to take a bearing. So you can practice it in a nice, safe environment where, you know, if it doesn't go quite right, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go horribly wrong. Um, so you can sort of, you know, uh, practice uh, putting your map on the compass, turning the compass housing. You know, if it's on a laminated map, then your compass will slip. So having a paper map inside an Ortlieb map case is really helpful because um, the compass will stick to an Ortlieb map case. Whereas if you, it's like anything, if you, you know, if you cut corners and you know, uh, I think value for money. So if you buy a cheap <laughs> map case then your compass will just slide off it and it'll be really awkward to use in the rain. Whereas if you pay a little bit more for a quality uh, waterproof map case, um, then, then the compass will stick to it and that's far easier when it's wet or, it, or when you've got gloves on, uh, et cetera. Uh, you might want to crouch down and put your map on, on your knee if it's windy. This is something you want to do in quite a, you know, so you feel comfortable in taking your bearing. You don't want to take your bearing when you're feeling a bit under stress because that's when mistakes can happen. So, there's no way, if you haven't taken a bearing before, or like all I can do here is direct you in, in the best direction, okay? <laughs> Pardon the pun. Um, because, it, and I've got YouTube li links at the end to, to help with this. But basically what I'm doing is, um, so this is the summit of Mila Bukal here, which is my, gonna be my, my key point of the day. And I, and I, wanna, and I want to um, head off down this ridge. Now, the, what we always do is we always take a guesstimate um, so, you know, uh, top of the map, 
or north is zero or 360. Yeah, and then east is 90, south is 180, west is 270, and then we're back to north again. So here on this map here, this is, so north is up here at the top of the map. Um, I'm walking on almost a southerly direction, yeah. So, my, so I'm going to be thinking in my head, right, okay, it's going to be round about the 180s, and I'm expecting it to be either side of that. If I take my bearing and I've got something like 360, I know that I've made an error. And my error is probably either I've turned my compass housing the wrong way around, or I've, um, sorry, my base plate the wrong way around, or I've turned this, this compass housing incorrectly. Yeah. So the key thing is I line up my base plate in the direction I want to go, which is down this ridge. I turn my compass housing so that the north to south grid lines on this uh, orienteering lines line up with the north to south grid lines on my Harvey's map. Now that is the only downside to Harvey's map is the grid lines on the Harvey's map are brown and they're quite hard to see. Whereas on the OS maps, they're blue, so a lot easier to see. So pros and cons. Um, and then to make sure I walk in the correct direction, I then turn the compass so that the red arrow, red floaty arrow sits in the red fixed arrow, yeah. Now I don't follow the red arrow because it means I'm always gonna walk north. Okay, I've got to follow my base plate and I've got a little bit of video here to help show that. So what Emma's doing here is she's taking her bearing, she's holding the compass and she's turning her body until the two red arrows get over each other. Yeah. Here's another image of that. So different type of compass, actually I can't, this is my own one. I can't remember what, what, what this one's called, but what I like about this one is, is the arrow settles really quickly. And it's got, <laughs> I have to wear plus ones now for reading. So it's got a really big magnifier so I can see the map. And on the end here, I can measure in mils. But as you can see here, my bearing is down this path. Uh, this is actually from on this point up on the hillside. You can see I've got my red floaty arrow, well, you can't quite see it, but over my red fixed arrow, and I'm lining up down the path. And this is where, because this path's a bit irregular, it sort of disappears. And you can see here, I'm, I'm doing the same thing here. I'm looking down this ground. And if you notice, I'm holding the compass slightly away from me. I don't wanna, I don't wanna make sure, I wanna make sure I've got nothing magnetic around my wrist. And I want to make sure I don't hold my compass too close to my body so that my mobile phone affects it. The other key thing, don't put your compass next to your mobile phone in your rucksack. Yeah, because the, the magnetic screen will impact uh, your compass. OK, that's really important. And two ways I can walk on a bearing. I can either walk on the bearing, holding it in front of me, watching it the whole time to make sure I stay on track. Be careful with this because you can trip over. So you need to be looking up, see where you're going and following the bearing. Watch this bit of video. Oh, come back. Is it gonna play for me? Oh, drop. Let's see if this next one plays. Or the other way of walking on a bearing is to walk on, is to line the bearing up to, to an obvious feature and then walk to that feature and then, and then take, take your bearing and then line your bearing up again like this. rough day actually <laughs> um so i'm sorry that first bit of video didn't play i don't know why that did but you get get the idea with that one is i'm lining the the, the bearing up and then walking to, to a feature that i saw and then i'd be lining my bearing up again and, and the reason we practice taking bearings in good weather is so that we can do it in bad weather like like, like what we saw there yeah great okay so um going back to our kind of five d's you know um and taking that time out to look at taking a bearing. We've got our direction as in from setting our map. We're then sort of designing our, our route. Where do we want to go? And, um, and that's where, you know, my fat map and my planning can really help because I, what, I, what I call like a handrail is, uh, a, in, in navigation terms, a handrail is a really good uh, line feature. It could be a good footpath. Uh, and uh, in this route, the footpath is this route along here. Uh, and uh, a handrail can also be a good line feature. So the ridge that I'm going to take my bearing down. Yeah. And, you know, a handrail might be something like this. You can see this, you know, this path's an absolute motorway um, for, you know, a lot of the time in Scotland, we do have good paths like this, but a lot of time we are off the path because 
we've got so 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 many areas that people can visit we don't tend to have the same intensity of um, of areas that you can have uh, down in the peak district or the lakes or north wales uh, where you know a large population is focused on a very small area what we tend to have is a small population focused on a really massive area so we haven't got many areas like this where we've got a really used used footpath um, other examples of handrails so i'm saying the paths and streams that make good handrails uh, another one that, that that we might use out on the mountain when we're not on a path because you know what we want to do is we want to build ourselves up so we can build confidence in, in not having to walk on paths all the time. Because if, we, if we're not confident to, in our navigation and we walk on paths all the time, that's, we're, always, we're, we're never gonna reach our, our ceiling. Um, our, you know, uh, we're never gonna expand our, our horizons. So having the confidence to step off the path and go into rough open land is a, is, is a good place to go to be once you've got the confidence, the experience of, of doing lots of paths, going the right way, not getting lost, being on top of things, then it's good to, to step off the path. And what we're, relying, what we're relying on then is using contour features and the shape of the ground. And so a really good handrail, an obvious example is you're walking along a valley and you've got steep sides, steep, steep sides either side. Well, that's, that's, you, that's you following a handrail and that might be off a path, yeah. Um, or you might just, or you might be following a, um, a high plateau where um, you know the the ground drops off either side, but there's no path. So, so the handrails can be contour features as well. They don't just, you know, they're not just footpaths and burns. Um, so, uh, going back to my uh, kind of um, my my route, which is from Glenmore Lodge, walking anti-clockwise over Mielabuco, back down to Glenmore Lodge. Then as I'm walking along, what I'm, what I'm doing to keep my journey flowing is I'm not going to stop at every single junction and try and get my map out and work out what I'm doing. I'm going to have a bit of map memory of, a, of a, you know, if I'm going from Glenmore Lodge, say, to my own Bothy, I'm going to be thinking, OK, I'm going to cross, you know, two junctions. I'm going to cross a burn, walk by a wee lock -in, and then I'm going to get to uh, my own Bothy before I start my ascent of Mila Buco. And in navigation terms, we call these tick-off features or collecting features. Yeah, so here's a track junction. Oh, I'm just pointing to it there on the map. Here's another one. This is another collecting feature where the path crosses the burn that comes under the path. And there's the burn there. Um, here's another collecting feature, which is the wee lock-in here on the way past. Yeah, we call it locally, it's called the fairy lock-in because you tell the kids that the fairies wash their clothes in there. That's why the water's green, but actually it's the algae. And then so you've got three, three really good positive collecting features there. So there's like a track junction, there's a burn crossing the, the, the end of the track, there's a wee lock in, and then my catching feature is something really, really um, solid. Something isn't going to disappear, and I'm not expecting this bothy to dis disappear in any time soon. Um, another really good catching feature, you might, you might, this is actually a very strong junction here, that could be a catching feature, um, a, a big, um, a big uh, lake or loch, uh, so um, could, it's a good catching feature, uh, and I've got some more examples here, um, a call, this catching feature, this change in terrain, um, if you're contouring the hillside, hitting this spear would be a catching feature, so something where it's going to be impossible for you to miss it, yeah. Great. So as well on my journey, I want to, again, I want to go back to sort of working out. So for me to, you know, work on my legs, I've got my catching features, my collecting features, sorry, my tick off and collecting features. I've got something that's going to catch me so I don't overrun, but also I want to have an, an, an idea of time. Uh, and that's not just a guess that is, you know, I'm, I'm going to work that out by measuring, you know, and like I said, I like to use mills because on any scale, so one millimeter on a Harvey's one of 40, one mil is 40 meters. So it means 10 mil, a centimeter is 400 meters. Works, works easy, okay, in my head. Um, um, on a one to 50, one mil is gonna be 50 meters. So a centimeter is half kilometer, so on and so forth. When I've worked out my distance, you know, I can work out, okay, that's, you know, two kilometers or three kilometers. Then it means that I can work out, well, the duration, how long is that going to take me? Actually, how much effort is that? Is it 20 minutes or two hours? And that's something that I find when I'm working is folk can really struggle to work, you know, that whole concept of time. And it is losing track of time that can really um, uh, get us into trouble and can get us lost. 
So keeping track of time is really important. So and that's only going to happen if we can accurately measure distance and work out how long time things are going to take us. So my apologies for the busy slide here, but my my best top tip I've got is this chart here is called the Nay Smith's Rule Timing Chart. Please Google that. Put in like Google Pics. Loads of this is where this came. You know, loads of examples have come up. Print one off, cut it out, uh, laminate it if you've got that option, or put it in a you know um, uh, protected from the weather. Um, and this is a great way for working out how long you think um, a, a journey is going to take you. And what you can do is you can work out individual legs, but also you can work out the time for the whole journey. So you know that if you're getting a bus or a train, you, can, you know how long it's going to take you to then get back to get the next bus or the train. Yeah. Uh, the other thing to make sure is make sure you add on time for the um, for ascent as well. We, we don't tend to add on any extra time for descent, uh, for going downhill, but for going uphill, uh, we tend to add time on. And what I tend to do is I, I say to folks, if the contour lines are really tight together, really tightly squeezed together, then I add on a minute for every contour line that I'm going up. If the contour lines are, are really spread apart, apart, quite stretched, then I'll maybe only add 30 seconds uh, for, for, a, um, for a contour line. And sorry, when I mean contour line as well, I mean like uh, on, the, on the OS where it's 10 meters. Uh, Harvey's maps, so pros and cons, downside to Harvey's maps is their contour lines are every 15 meters, okay? So there's some different maths there to work out. And I think at the bottom, we have got an example. So here we go, you know, four, four kilometers with 200 meters e easy angled uh, height gain is an hour and 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, uh, and 4K an hour is actually quite quick. So I would say if you're walking with a group of friends, you're probably gonna walk about three kilometers an hour. You're probably gonna walk at 4K if it's maybe you and a friend and you're quite fit and you'll probably walk on 5K on your own if you've, you know, you're out for a blast. So, and you probably walk at 2K an hour if, if you're with, you know, a gang of family, you know, and every chan and you stop to look at snails and leaves and stuff like that, so. Um, great. Now then, I'll drop this one in. This is this kind of, this, this definitely is starting to just creep up to something else. Uh, this almost maybe is heading, heading off a question that might come in. Um, some people, when, it, when we start talking about, you know, working out, working out distance, how long is it going to take? Uh, working out, you know, look at our watch, how long, you know, you might even use an altimeter, um, you know, to, to sort of want to see your height gain. Um, pacing is another useful tool, but I'm only going to use pacing if I'm, in, if I'm in poor weather and it's a short navigational leg. So uh, this there's two types of my, for me, there's two kinds of navigation. There's, there's, there's macro, big picture, and there's micro, which is doing a very short, short, short leg. Big picture is, you know, you can be walking along a forest track to, to like the, the example I've been using, uh, of, to the tick off features to a really big co uh, collecting feature. Um, but if I'm going to pace, it's probably because I'm off the path and I'm maybe walking on a bearing and I'm going to, you know, 500 meters to a, to, to a definite feature, which is maybe a changing contour or a lock in or something. And that's where beforehand, um, this isn't something I'm just gonna discover my pacing there and then. This is something I'm gonna practice in good weather. So when I'm outside in bad weather, I've got an idea of what my pacing is. And I've, I've got an example here that, you know, an av you know, a walk of average height of a flat ground is 60 double paces for hundred meters. It's gonna vary for everybody. Yeah, it's gonna be different if you're tired. It's gonna be different if you've got a heavy rucksack on, if you're walking uphill or downhill. So these are all things for you to go out and um, experiment to find out how many double paces you over 100 meters for steep terrain, downhill and on the flat. And this is where te technology is really good. If you've got a view ranger app in your phone, just put start track, pace um, and, and start pace, start counting. Wait till, the, wait till your, your, your phone hits 100 meters and then see how many paces that was. So um, that, that's, one way, well, that's one way of doing it. Um, we've got a huge big tape measure. We, we measure it out at work. We've got two posts and we pace between that. Uh, and I, I'm six foot tall and I'm 56 double paces on the flat. But hey, but it's different for everybody. If I'm going up something really steep, that might go up to 90 paces. Yeah. I want to say any questions, but no one can speak. Uh, and the fight, and so you did. So, one of the final ones I'm going to look at here before I look at what starts to go wrong is, is the description. So, 
you know, I've got my journey, you know, I, I've, I've planned out my route, I'm going anti-clockwise, I'm going on the track, I've got kind of collecting features, I've got some good catching features. I know, you know, that I'm gonna have to take a bearing off, off, off the summit here because there's no path. Um, if it's good viz, I might just need a very rough bearing, just in fact, general direction. If it's poor viz like that bit of video, then I'm gonna take a, a, a proper bearing to get myself off the hill here. But the final thing with the description is, what am I gonna be expecting? You know, what do I expect it to look like? How do I expect the terrain to be? So if I'm stood here at Rivo and Bothy, what do I expect to see? Well, at Rivo, I'm expecting to, the Bothy to be there, hopefully, and it's quite flat. And, but I'm expecting to see a hillside going up in front of me. You know, I'm expecting steep ground. And if I was at this point here, what am I going to expect? Well, I'm probably on the steepest part of the path there, and I'm expecting a steep, rugged mountain path. Yeah, so there we go. That's me at my rowan. I'm on the flat. Oh, the bothy's just, just showing there. You can see the hill going up in front of me. And here I am, part way up the hill, and I can see it's a pretty steep, steep, rugged path. Yeah. So trying to kind of visualize um, what it's going to be like is really useful. And that's where, um, you know, a lot of the um, uh, websites, uh, I'm trying to think, Highland, um, Highland Hill Walks is, is one that we use, because you'll have people's photos in it, and that really helps you visualize um, what it is, uh, where it is that you're going to be going. Great. Hey, so look, that's me. You know, I've done, done, done my mountain journey. Whenever, whenever I'm doing my, my walk, then at the end of the day, I'm always going to, I'm always going to review it. I'm going to reflect on it rather than review it. I don't want to sound too formal. I'm going to reflect on sort of my experience, the experience of my friends or family, whoever I was with, or my, my students, you know, the people I'm working with, and then I'll make adjustments for next time, you know, and they might be adjustments to make it even more positive, um, or there might be adjustments because maybe something didn't go quite right. And I want to, I want to prevent what this next slide is about of, of being out too long in poor weather or, or being out at night um, or, or getting lost. So being able to review, you know, sleep on, sleep on it, have a think about what you've done, you know, why was that longer than I thought? Why did we get tired? You know, damn it, you know, forgot, didn't pick enough food or whatever it might be. It's really good to do that rather than just doing the same thing and, and making the same mistakes and then actually falling out of love with, with, with something that, you know, originally you really enjoyed. Um, up here, you know, it says poor weather, you know, I think something we need to, we all need to accept is if, if we all sat at home and waited for the good weather to get out and, and enjoy a day out, then um, we're doing a disservice to ourselves. We're, we're going to miss out on what can be a, 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 what can be a good experience. It's amazing how many times I've gone out expecting poor weather and I've actually had a really good weather day. And there's other times I've gone out in good weather and it's ended up being a poor weather day. So it's all part of the parcel. And you know, for us to expand our, our horizons and develop ourselves and be and feel confident in the outdoors, there's going to be times when we're going to we're going to dip our toe into that kind of poor weather. It's making sure that we're doing that, for, which is for you at the right time, when you feel that you've got the right skill level, um, and when you're with and if you're out with other people, that they're also at the right skill level and, and buying into this. But you know that kind of the more you dip your toe in it, the more experience you'll get and the more confidence you'll get that, you know, if you, you know, that then going out in poor weather, that you'll be able to deal, deal with any kind of situation. Um, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to just pile out there when it's really atrocious conditions, uh, you know, lightly dressed, um, not too sure about your navigation skills. That's, that's, um, that's you uh, not being very responsible. So, you know, everybody's responsible for their own, um, you know, their own cells and what they do, but we can't ignore it. British weather is really fickle. It changes all the time. So we need to start dipping our toe into it. And you might even find, you might even quite enjoy the challenge. Yeah. So poor weather, night navigation. The reason I've got night navigation in there is this is the classic where um, it's amazing how many, it doesn't take much for your day to be delayed and you end up walking in tonight. It's always, I'll always give advice that if when you get to that autumn or winter, early winter time of year, um, if the earlier you start, then you're always going to walk into the daylight. Whereas if you start late, you're always going to, you, you, what's going to happen is you're going to walk into the dark 
And once it's dark, it's dark. It isn't going to get light again, not for about probably about 12 hours. So start in the start in the dark, walk into the light. Yeah. God, I sound like I'm preaching now. <laughs> walk to the light. So um key thing is don't panic. Okay. So when you're out in bad weather, don't panic. It's about doing the basics well, but also um being comfortable with the technology. Now, there's a lot of downsides to technology. They, technology will not work in the rain. You get your smartphone out in the rain, and as soon as you get a raindrop on the screen, it will just you know, highlight everything. So make sure that you've got your smartphone in a proper waterproof map case. Make sure that you've got a stylus so you can use it. Make sure you've had it on things like um, flight mode, so your battery's been saved. Uh, make sure um, you know, that it's bright enough that you can see it and only use you know use it just to locate yourself okay so let's say you've you know you've headed out there you're not too sure you just want to check before you take your bearing off the hill then the technology is really good just for that kind of check and challenge don't now resort to your technology it's there just to sort of go this this is where you are crack on make sure it's a well-designed leg yeah so make sure you're going to a really good catching feature or you're going to you use you can use a really good line feature to get you to your catching feature so good handrails path or a burn or spur etc and trust your bearing take your guesstimate trust your bearing okay follow your bearing um three new uh, and a few, few, couple of things to add in there i'm going to point them out is um having a, a solid attack point what aiming off is and like i was saying good, good catching good catching feature so attack point is um very similar to a catching feature actually it's something where you're going right i definitely know i definitely uh when when i get to here i'm definitely going to know where that is and i'm going to take my next bearing from this really strong attack point um i've shown my right bone here because we're familiar with that uh, another example here is this is uh, a ring contour on top of a ridge um it could be a summit it, a, a tap point could be where two two footpaths really strong footpaths uh, cross each other um etc um, aiming off if I'm walking on my bearing and I need to, I need to get to the, I need to get to a point, then I'm not going to take my bearing directly to it because there is always drift on a bearing. Always, always doesn't matter how good a navigator you are, there will always be slight drift. That's why we always tend to aim to quite big features or quite a good catching feature. What I won't do is di take my bearing directly to maybe a spot height in the middle of a plateau. So something that could be easily missed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to purposely aim off to one side, knowing that when I hit my plateau, I know I turn right and I'm going to get to my to my ring feet, my my ring contour, my trig point, or, or my wee bothy or whatever it is. So I'm purposely aiming off. Okay, that's a really good technique to, to, to have. And strong catching features. This is a great one. This look what, what a great obvious T junction. I've come down this mountain path, bang, major footpath. When I hear that, I know I turn right. Yeah. So really good strong catching features. Or, or if it's dark at night, you know, something where it's a good water feature. So you're going to get your feet wet, you know, that, 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 that'll tell you that you got there. Yeah. Great. Um, worst case scenario, if you get lost. Yeah. Now, hands up. Yeah. You know, all of us, you know, my, my colleagues included, at some point we've been lost. Um, for me, it was... Um, uh, a day where it actually hadn't been original plan for that day. We'd had other plans. So it was further down our kind of list of what we were going to do that day. So it wasn't as well planned. It wasn't as well thought out. Bit last minute, we'd let, we'd let, we decided to leave some stuff in the car, um, et cetera. Then we realized we needed it on the hill because it was a bigger ambition then than, than what we realized. And on the summit from the hill, the weather was so bad and we were so, and we're quite chilly because we're lightly dressed. We dropped out, we dropped down the wrong side of the mountain. And it wasn't until we were halfway down the mountain where we came out of the cloud and we're expecting to see the road that we saw a big um, sea loch and we realized we'd gone completely 100 degree, 180 degrees wrong. Yeah. So there was a few, there was some, you know, uh, um, sense of humor failure uh, that day, especially with my wife. Um, so the key thing is if you get lost, don't panic. Okay. Can the technology help? Okay. What you tend to find is if people get lost is it's probably because the technology's run out and it might have been that they were relying on that a little bit. Okay. But hopefully if you kept your phone warm, you've had it on flight mode, 
and you've just used it to go, I'm just going to do a self check here. Am I where I think I am? Yeah, great. I am where I am. Then fantastic. I uh, pull the knowledge. So, you know, where were we last? You know, what did the ground do? Did it go up? Did it go down? You know, you're working back from the previous known point. You know, how long was it? You know, we lo did we lose track of time? Oh, no, it was only 20 minutes. Well, we can't be that lost if we've only been walking 20 minutes. Um, what's the ground doing around me? Is it going up? Is it going down? Like, what's caused me to stop? Um, and then I might just work out, well, what's the ground? Which way is the ground facing? And we call that taking an aspect of slope. Yeah. Um, and once I've worked that out, um, then it's important to move. There's no point in staying still because there's only, you're only going to get so much information. If you take an aspect of slope and you know that the slope in front of you is south, then, okay, if I'm on a south slope, well, what's in front of me? Is it going to get less steep or steeper? Am I going to hit a water feature? Is it going to be a ridge? So you need to build the information. So slope aspect, yeah, you know, if I'm stood up here, well, which way is the ground facing? Is it gradual? Is a, you know, uh, re-entering features here does it is it gradual then to steeper ground and hopefully i'll gain enough information that i can work out where i am yeah oh, 45 minutes to finish on a positive it's not always poor visibility and i'm going to leave you with a quite a few useful links and what i'd probably ask you to do here because i'm going to come off this in a second so you can start seeing folk uh, who are presenting. But if you can take a photo of that, um, there's some useful references. There we go, Walk Islands. That was the website I meant when it comes to sort of good good images of, of hill walks. But what I've also got on here is, um, you know, taking a bearing, nice bit of YouTube, um, how to take aspect of slope, um, and also just how to, you know, doing your entire leg uh, for a navigation leg. So I'd really encourage you after this talk um, to, to click onto this website just to help build on, on um, what I was chatting about there. Great. That is me. I don't know if the guys have been answering many questions. Oh, I see the chat box has been busy. So we'll see what Bill has to say. Hey, John, that was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, th there's quite a few questions come in, so ho hopefully that's um, hopefully we've managed to answer most of them. Please feel free to keep adding while we're, we're chatting. Um, I do have a couple here, John, for you. Um, the first one is, um, could you explain the difference and the significance, and if we need to know um, the difference between magnetic north and true north? Oh, good question. Yeah, no, you don't. Well, I say no, you don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, grid more. When it, the, the variation is so, best, I'm trying to do, keep this simple as I can. The variation is so slight now that we just don't worry about it. Yeah. Because also when, when I take a bearing, as soon as I look up, my, my needle's going to move anyway. So we're, we're basically, we're always navigating in, in a, what we call a corridor of error. And, but it seems to work. Yeah. And what we do is we always make sure that we're, we're, we're working to, a, if it's a long distance, to a big feature that's going to catch us, or we're going to walk, or we're going to navigate a very short distance, so the error is very, very limited. Um, but when I started, you know, I've been I've been working the outdoors for thirty years, uh, a little bit over now. And when I first started in the outdoors, um, I think I had to add on something like twelve degrees or something like that. But now it's so close; there's only a degree or two in it that it's something I don't I don't have to worry about. We, like I'm I'm not teaching that at the moment. Yeah, it's not. You're showing your age, John. <laughs> I'm an old man. Um, I've got a couple more, but Giles, would you like to come in? Do you have a couple? He's hiding. You're having a bad hair day. I'm oh, hiding. Oh, he's no, I'm hiding. just looking at the questions that are coming in, the question and answers. I, I did. I, I had a problem with the um, something was not quite working, and I had to uh, yeah type answers instead. Um, now there's a question here about going up to um, living in East Anglia and walking challenges here are not the same as up north. Where does one go to get information about where and when it's possible to walk in Scotland? Well, I'll answer the last bit first. Is it's possible to walk anytime and anywhere in Scotland? Um, so that's the first answer. Um, but information about it uh, is there's numerous sources, and apart from bringing us up at Glenmore Lodge, which is one way, um, is there's a really good one, really good website. And I don't mind putting this out there. Is uh, it's called Walk Highlands. And it's uh, a, a full of really, really useful information about all kinds of walks. 
including um, route maps and things like that. So I, I point you towards that really. It's a fantastic resource and we all use it. Right. Um, John, one for you. Um, any recommendations for head torches? <laughs> That's surely like Giles, isn't it? He's, he's a petrol man. Uh, oh, well, well, I'll be doing the same as everybody else out there. Now I'll be Googling it and looking. But no, if I was, if I was to rec recommend someone, then uh, like petrol head torches, uh, that's what we all use at work. Like they're, they're brilliant. They're so reliable. Uh, or, you know, rechargeable. Uh, you can Bluetooth them to your phone, get the app so you can see what the lifespan is on them. You can adjust it to the beam. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. But, but when it comes to individual models, you know, like I said, I'm, I've already said I'm old, so I, I can't remember what they're called. But but uh, Giles might be able to help me out with that. But you know, perhaps I had torches. But what definitely what I don't recommend because um, we had a fire at Glenwell Lodge uh, two years ago because, uh, for someone who was on a um, a hill walking course, and they plugged in their um, head torch to charge and left it on the bed. And it was like uh, they, they'd, got, they'd got it on eBay and it was uh, imported from China. And while it was charging, it heated up and uh, it melted the battery and it set the duvet on fire, which then set the room on fire, which then caused a whole world of strife for us. <laughs> but thank goodness for fire doors, etc. There's loads of, loads of smoke damage. So yeah, do not, do not buy from overseas. Definitely buy, uh, go, go for some like petrol, someone, people who are really well recognised. Um, I've got a couple more here and I'll ask both questions because I think they're both linked um, to the same answer really. So David um, was asking, what is the best way of assuring your group that although I have gone away, perhaps a little bit lost, yeah. everything will be okay. And in general, knowing some may be cool, but putting some, a bit of pressure on you when, you when you're with a group that are seeing you as a leader. Yeah, um, just, just, just bribe them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to send to that. For me, uh, David, that's, it's being honest because we're all human and we all do make a wee bit of mistake. But I think having, if you've not involved people and the people you're with in the planning process and all of a sudden you say you're lost, the world is in your shoulders. But being really honest and right back at the beginning of the day, you involving people with your planning process rather than saying, this is where we're going. I say, hey guys, this is what we should see along the way. And people will then ask you things and a discussion will happen. Um, causing you probably to pick up those wee errors before they become an issue and getting you lost. So for me, planning and involving people in the planning and involving people in the journey and putting your ego to the side and actually saying, you know what, folks, this is, this is taking longer than we thought. How's about as a group we decide to change plan so we're not in this unknown terrain in the dark? And on the planning as well, sorry, someone else asked, um, what was the 3D software you used on the presentation? And and again, that's a brilliant tool for planning. So both Memory Map and Anquet are two mapping softwares that are available on your PC or Apple um, on, on the computer. And they've both got just one button that says View 3D. There's no fanciness you have to use. One button you press and it shows you that 3D. In terms of for your actual app, for your phone, um, when it comes to mind is Fact Map, which I think also gives you some 3D elements, slightly different from what you had there. But again, definitely part of the planning process rather than on the hill process for that thing. Can I answer the GPS question that's next from Peter Wood? Yeah, so uh, Peter Wood asks, should I be keeping my GPS warm inside a jacket or pack or are they typically more reliable in colder temperatures and phones? Um, I like to have mine kept to my packs strap to track my path and the and still familiarising. That, that last comment's really good. I, so I'd say the first thing you want to be doing is trying your GPS out when it doesn't really matter so much and finding out about how long the battery lasts. So get your battery fully charged, have it outside and on um, and, find, and work out ways of how you like to use it best. So I've done a lot of GPS use and I, one thing I do with mine is I have rechargeable batteries. So I always fully recharge them before I go out. And I have spare batteries as well, which I take with me. Um, I detune my GPS so that I don't have a bright screen during daytime, but at nighttime I have the light on that I'm using it at night. So I do various things that manage the battery and a lot of GPSs have that. So I'd say get to know your, your GPS, get to know it in good conditions, but yeah, take it out and try it in different modes 
Um, and you should find most GPSs now have really good battery life. Certainly, um, I'd say mine, which uses AA batteries, uh, it will last 12 hours if I use it conservatively. If I've got the screen on the whole time, it'll probably last six hours or a little bit less. So knowing your performance of your own unit is what I'd recommend. But they are reliable, they're very good. Not reliable when the battery runs out though. So take some spares. Hey, thanks, Charles. Um, I've got another one here. Uh, do you change any of your techniques for winter mountaineering? I think, um, why don't we put that to the three of us and we can all, all add one wee thing in that we change. And, uh, and I'm going to take the easy one and go first. <laughs> so, yeah, I, actually, I, I do change a little bit um, or, or something I'm more aware of. And perhaps as, that, as we get colder weather and I'm working with big gloves, it's pretty easy when you've got dexterous hands to deal with your, your map and compass. You, you know, in the Cairngorm Plateau, a, a blown blizzard, I want to make sure that I've definitely practised with big gloves on and a map case. Everything's much bulkier and potentially goggles as well when it's more difficult to see down. So practising in the better weather before you get into that full-on winter environment for me is something I do. John? Uh, yeah, sorry. My Wi-Fi cut out just a little bit then, Bill. Were you talking about gloves, using gloves? And oh, sorry. Gloves. Um, anything you, you change navigationally in the winter to summer? Yeah. And I was yeah, just talking about yeah. making sure you practice with bulky gloves and goggles, that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, just making sure that you... Um, uh, I'll, 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 start with the, uh, I'll start with the story in that um, uh, I went on a rescue many, many years ago uh, on the um, ben, on the Ben McDewey plateau, and it was three uh, cadets, and uh, it was November, and we're, it's a time of year where... In November, you can either have stable high pressure and you can glorious weather, crisp and cold, but clear, or winter can come, you know, and it can come really severe and we can have some of our coldest and most largest amounts of snowfall. And unfortunately, this is one of those where these three cadets have gone out. It was before smartphones and getting up to date weather forecasts. And they were doing a two day trip and they got caught out by the, they caught out by the, the weather that night uh, and they had to, and they couldn't get to where they wanted to camp and they had to sort of uh, sleep out in the open in their sleeping bags, sort of bivy out um, in sort of like, uh, you know, really bad conditions. And the rescue team we had to go in, we picked them up, to them are really severely hypothermic, and we managed to walk them out. And when we were chatting with them, you know, uh, they were going, oh, you know, I can't believe, you know, I have, you know, the, the weather, you know, I can't believe it, that it turns so quickly, etc. And, you know, I've never got lost before. I'm really confident with my navigation. And just on a bit more questioning, it's like, well, how much navigation have you done in, 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 those, in, in winter? It's like, oh, no, I've never done any uh, navigation in winter. It's only ever been in summer. So and what, what happened was in this, this summer walk, it turned into winter conditions. Um, so, you know, when it comes to walking out in winter, the best way to practice for winter is to really be, is to really make sure your summer, skills, summer hill walking skills are really sharp. But then also getting out in some in some bad summer weather, yeah. Uh, and then it means then that when we get into winter weather, it won't feel so bad because you know you've sort of been there before a little bit in those summer conditions. Uh, um, so basically, what you're doing is you're sort of you know you you you're cutting your teeth in kind of safeish conditions for you, so that when you go into winter, you've already got that some of that experience under your belt. Yeah. So for me, that would be that would be key. Rather than just going, hey, I'm going to go to winter and expect everything to work, because um, because guaranteed, you know, it'll be it'll feel challenging. Cool. Cool. Thanks, John. A um, couple more. Um, you know, it's just sorry, it's just scrolled up. Where are we? We've all came in at once. Um, thought there was a planning one there. Somebody's asking what type of GPS we recommend. I, I, again, it's personal preference, really. Uh, with all the technology, I think it'll be hard find hard push to find a bad GPS. But often the more expensive ones with all the fancy features are actually potentially a wee bit more complicated than what you need. So top of the range isn't always the, the best for our environment and what we're doing. Um, any other top tips for staying safe in the winter? Um, I guess that ties in with the navigation in the winter as well. It's not just being able to practice the techniques, but often the terrain. So, for example, in the summer, 
I will handrail or use an edge to follow along in the winter. I, I tend not to do that. I'm super cautious of edges in the winter. So um, I, I try to build my navigational legs where I'm not following along an edge um, as opposed to in the summer where that seems perfectly appropriate. Hope that makes sense. Sorry, answer some, oh, just reading through the questions sorry, again. Answer some questions on the do GPS's devices become obsolete? Um, I could again, I, I'm answering this from experience of having quite an old GPS. And actually, what I did was I upgraded it because more modern GPSs work quicker, um, they have a better battery life, um, and there's certain more additional features. So they, they do new things do come in. And all the time they're adapting them. So it's more to become, um, yeah, modernize my stuff. But it, it's still the old GPS still gave really accurate reading. So there's no problem with that. Um, I just had better features on the new one. So it's not necessarily my current GPS, if I could show it you, is quite corroded on the outside because I've used it a lot in sea kayaking. But I got that about 10 years ago now, I think it was. And it still uh, operates as well as it did. 10 years ago as it does now. Great. Uh, I think that's us for the questions, John and Giles. Great. John, that was an excellent talk. Thanks very much. Um, no, thanks. thanks, everybody. I think we'll hand over Mark just to, <laughs> to round us up. And thanks very much, everyone, for coming. I'll uh, hand over to you, Mark. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks very much, John, Bill and Giles. Uh, really good talk there. And, and thank you, everyone, for all your questions as well and for joining us this evening. Please do check out Glenmore Lodges courses if you want to hear anything um, further and get some training under your belt this summer. Yeah, you won't regret it, that's for sure. So um, great. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. Thank you. Good night.